good evening. Uh, my name is Nicholas Blith. I am the Director of Public and Academic Affairs at the General Delegation of the Government of Affairs to the United States here with headquarters in New York. Um, welcome all. I have a very special welcome, I should say. Uh, we have a very special guest in our midst, and that's Laura Connolly, the daughter of Johan uh, Pez and Kat, which is what we will be discussing today. So you know, for everyone, that's a real treat, and that's a really special that <laughs> you're here with us uh, this evening. So um, I was asked to uh, introduce uh, this evening's uh, event, this evening's panel, and uh, thank you for it, Francois. I appreciate it. So, um, uh, tonight we will have uh, Splendor, Turbans and Greens, Great Medieval Ports and Culture in the Burgundian North, which of course, as you all know, Flanders uh, was a big part of. Tonight we'll have a book launch and a discussion. Uh, some of you might have seen the book out front. Um, they're not for sale, but we have some flyers if you want, if you really enjoy the, the topic and the book, please take some and you'll be able to order uh, like that. So uh, the book is called Rereading Hersing Half, Autumn of the Middle Ages, a Century Later. As I said, I'd like to thank the European Institute and Francois Perel for inviting me this evening to make a few brief remarks. Um, it's a real pleasure and honor, of course, to be here at Columbia, one of the America's uh, prestige universities, and for us a real partner in our work, uh, working with academic institutions and research centers around uh, the country. Tonight is uh, not only a celebration of the academic collaboration and exchange uh, between Flanders and the United States, but it's also a, a time for us, uh, for the government of Flanders and in my office here, to think about you know, the future and our goals on academic diplomacy, where we'd like to have more students and scholars, like, like the people here on the panel, come to America from Belgium, and also having US scholars and students going uh, to Belgium and discover our universities um, and our libraries and our culture and our arts as well, of course. On a personal note, it's also very special for me this evening because two people in the room I actually had class from about 15 years ago. So <laughs> I, Professor Mark Bona had my first year of uh, my Master's in History. So I'm a historian uh, by uh, not by trade, but by education, I would say, so now I'm in government relations, so it helps here and there. But also, of course, uh, Therese, who, uh, who taught me uh, paleography, or paleography, as we say in Dutch, and of course, for all, any researcher and student in the Middle Ages, you know that that is a very important topic, and that is the first thing you have to know before you can even start researching. So a lot of respect to both of you, and, Thank you so much. Uh, you played a little part in, in me being here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Johan Persica has said the middle team, and to say that the Dutch name is uh, not a political history, and nor is it a social or economic history. It's a history of mentality, which makes the book very special. Uh, how the people of the late Middle Ages think in the low countries around the 14th and 15th centuries. That is the question I believe as you have uh, tried to answer, and the fact that we're here a uh, hundred years later, um, and so many people in the audience and distinguished panel will be talking and discussing about this really proves to me that that was the right question to, uh, to ask as a historian, and it's very relevant uh, still today. Um, so that is a fascinating topic, and that's all I will say about it. I'll leave to the experts in a few minutes who, uh, who will discuss it more in-depth and more knowledgeable than I can. Um, the, just a few more things. I'd just like to say that we're very proud to support uh, this evening's event. I'm sorry, just looking at my notes here. And uh, that our courtship with Hazen has started about three years ago when we uh, organized the first workshop at our office in the New York Times building, which was also the starting point of the, of the book. Will be presented 
And I said it's a privilege uh, to call Columbia University our partner, and particularly the studies of the Dutch speaking world and European institutes. Uh, last year, we co organized a workshop on Van Eyck, which coincided with the Charter House of Bruce exhibition. Until uh, you're here in the audience, so thank you for that collaboration. Maybe some of you saw it at the Frick Collection last year, a very nice, uh, intimate exhibition. Uh, we also supported an archival trip for Columbia students to go to Flanders and do research at our universities, and that was the collaboration with Ghent University, my alma mater, and we hope to, uh, to have those uh, trips in the future as, as well. And the uh, last slide to say uh, on that note that we're looking forward to the next June of Alina, uh, visiting Professor David Bird from the <coughs> um, who will teach next spring a course on music, musicians, and mobility in the early modern period. Um, on a personal note, I just would like to say that you know, the work that Marx has been doing on uh, but, but the studies of Dutch people well, is just very important, especially for us. Uh, you know, not so many people in the world speak Dutch, about uh, 20 million, I, I believe, if that's correct, in a few countries. And just the fact that students and faculty are working on the history, the culture, the art history of our region and our language and our culture is so very important. Uh, just not in the transatlantic relationship with, with Europe, but also in the broader scale of getting to know Europe and uh, knowing you know, what Europe and America have done for each other in, in the past. Um, maybe not all the way to the Middle Ages, but definitely in the 20th century and uh, go forward in the future as well, of course. And then uh, lastly, I'd like to thank a few people or organizations, and that's of course the Studies of the Dutch Media World at Columbia University, the European Institute, and especially Francois Carrel, who's been a real partner in all our uh, endeavors, the Department of History, the Institute of Social and Economic Research Policy, the College of Arts and Sciences of the University of Hawaii, and last but certainly not least, uh, Ghent University. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Howell, who is, together with Professor uh, Pamela Smith, uh, Smith excuse me, the co-chair of the Studies of the Dutch Speaking World here at Columbia. So more than being the co-chair for me, uh, uh, Martha, you're really the heart of the program, and you really speak so enthusiastically and so uh, distinguished about the low countries, that uh, it's really an inspiration. I think every program needs someone like that to really, you know, especially this in, in these circumstances where funding is tight, to really keep uh, talking about, keep people interesting about, it. and just the fact that this room is so full for such a topic is uh, is, uh, is proof to that, and proof to your uh, you know, your enthusiasm and conviction. And uh, also, she's an honorary doctorate of the Ghent University, so that makes it even more special. <laughs> so, thank you so much for all that you do, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you again for your support of this program and this evening, and the workshop that preceded the volume that we're going to talk about tonight. I know uh, we have what I hope is going to be a useful and entertaining introduction to a discussion of housing this autumn of the Middle Ages. Now most of you know this is one of the most famous studies of late medieval culture and society. It's long been on reading lists on medieval and renaissance studies here in the United States and in Europe. But it's also been very, very high on the list of books that have baffled students. <laughs> Um, and often their teachers as well. The volume we're discussing tonight, rereading Housing Now, is in part an effort to de-baffle everybody, to make better sense of a narrative that explored aristocratic Burgundian society and culture at its apogee. Now here, it was suggested to me that I might show a few slides to remind everybody, because not everybody in the room might remember and know very well, the splendor of the Burgundian court in these centuries that are the subject of uh, Hersinger's book. So we have a map, so you can see it was an extensive realm that reached uh, north and south, but center, its cultural center was Flanders, uh, the richest part. Uh, here we have the great dukes in chronological order. There are two Philips, a John and a Charles. Uh, 
hear the kind of festivities that they were famous for, a great feast, elaborate feast. Here we have a gift-giving ceremony. That is um, Philip the Good receiving the gift. Um, here we have one of their fantasy dramas that was performed. Uh, here we have the tomb of Philip the Bold, the first Duke of Burgundy. That's in Dijon. It's a Clarcelte uh, sculpture. Uh, here we have the necklace of the Order of the Golden Feast, the most honorific and famous uh, chivalric order of the period. Um, that uh, kings of England, everybody wanted one. Um, and here we have the, the Vow of the, of the Pheasant, which was held in Lille, one of the cities that was part of this great realm, uh, which was uh, about to have yet another crusade, which, like a lot of things in that period, never happened. But they did have the party. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll go back to the map to keep it there as we talk tonight. Uh, to remind you. But before turning to the discussion of that wonderful book and our volume of essays, I want to re-thank everybody that made this possible. Uh, Nicola already listed all the organizations, so I'm not going to do it again. But I do want to particularly thank the European Institute who organizes all this for us. And I want to thank them too. They're videoing the evening tonight. So everybody's on television. I'll uh, remember that. Now, it is surely a, a measure of the importance of housing this book that this year there are at least four workshops and accompanying publications um, about this book. We were the first, but we're not <laughs> the only one. One is from Leiden, the home of the uh, housing archives, which is now being uh, digitized and recently published a gorgeously illustrated edition of the original 1990-1919 volume. There's another from Lille, the place where that uh, Bow of the Peasant was held. Uh, and, uh, it's, uh, and then the third is from Cambridge University in England, which is being organized as a blog discussion in which we will be participating, but other people who have been working on uh, housing will also contribute. Now, our program is distinguished, perhaps, by the fact that we invited speakers to the workshop and to contribute to our volume who were not necessarily housing the specialists. And they were not overwhelmingly Dutch or Belgian, although we allow a few of those kind of people. <laughs> Our intention was not thus to produce a discussion among people who had long studied and worked on this book, or even on housing as oeuvre all over in, in general. And we did not want to perhaps inadvertently produce a volume in praise of a great man, uh, although a great man he was indeed. Instead, we wanted to make the book more legible, to understand how and why housing wrote it as he did, and why it is or was hard for historians to understand when he published it, and also why it has nevertheless been a must-read on syllabuses all over the United States, both for students and scholars, and why it still is. So the essays in this volume thus explore housing as method. They place them in historical and particularly in political time. Um, and they also explore how some of the, the approach he took anticipated and to some extent gave birth to ways of writing history that came after him. The writers also tried to tease out not just the reasons for certain startling omissions in the book. The most startling is the fact that he barely mentioned the commercial and urban society that in fact fed the court. But at the same time, some of us have argued that he may have, in fact, positioned the market economy as the vague background to the magnificence of the court that he described. Now, I'm going to turn that discussion over to my colleagues and be a listener like you, and then we're going to turn it over to you to pose questions and make comments. But first, let me introduce my colleagues. Peter Arnada is my co-editor, and actually, he was the one that had the idea for this. It was his idea to have a workshop and his idea to approach University of Amsterdam Press for this volume of essays. We worked together assembling the cast of characters and editing the volume with the expert assistance of Antoine von der Lem of Leiden and the archivist at Leiden who couldn't be here tonight. But in fact, the original idea was Peter's. Um, 
he, like me, and maybe like some of you, have read, sometimes talked, and always admired this book. But all of us felt that we could use some help with it. <laughs> and so the workshop was an effort to help ourselves. Peter is Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Hawaii, but he's a specialist in late medieval and early modern low countries um, with several important books on political culture and culture more generally. And he most recently co-authored a study of pardon letters from the Duke of Burgundy. Peter has a lovely essay in the volume of on Hezinga as a cultural anthropologist avant the left. And he may talk about that a bit in his comments. My next speaker is Mark Bona, who's a professor of history at the University of Ghent and uh, for many years served as Dean of Humanities and Arts there. Although a specialist in institutional and fiscal history in Flemish cities during the late Middle Ages, he ranges much more widely, in particular into historiography and the traditions of scholarship in the greater Low Countries as a crossroads between Germanic and Francophone Europe. Um, Tonight, Mark will be drawing in part on his essay on the volume to make a few remarks about Hessinger's book and its reception in Belgium and France. Now, I've also asked two of my colleagues in the history department to speak for a few minutes about the place of Hessinger's book in scholarship, respectively, in the Middle Ages and the early modern period, and to comment uh, on our book, our volume of essays, and its usefulness uh, to them. Adam Costo is a professor of history a medievalist with particular expertise in legal and political history of the Central Middle Ages, as well as diplomatics. His latest book is a rich survey and examination of the logic and use of hostages in Western uh, European history, with not surprisingly a particular focus on the, on the Middle Ages, but also in considering the modern period and the differences in how hostages uh, are imagined and work in the modern period. Matt Jones is a professor of history here as well, a specialist in intellectual and cultural history during what is traditionally called the Renaissance. Although both as a scholar and a teacher, um, Matt tends to turn that tradition a little bit on its head. He has elegant studies in mathematics as moral work of the conceptual and technical problems of mechanizing mathematical calculation in the early modern period. And now he's working on big data, which I won't characterize because I don't understand. <laughs> um, all of his books are both expert technical studies and imaginative cultural studies. It's a heady mix. So I'm going to turn um, the evening over to my colleagues, and then we'll finish by asking each other questions, and then it's over to you. This is on. I think it is on. OK, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you see a beautiful fall colors in New York to wear a jacket <laughs> coming from Hawaii and uh, I've written I've written notes in a very retro way so um, Martha's put me on a very strict time limit of eight minutes so let me okay. see if I can stick to it so Martha used the term baffling to debaffle a book so we did not pre-plan this but I thought about that and I thought well what is baffling or what is unique about the book and I sketched a few things um, one thing is perhaps understandable it's mostly not read in its original language even though Hausinger was a great stylist. And so if you do read it in Dutch, you will see that in the 280-something attributions in the D standard Dutch dictionary, the Vandala are to him. To him. Um, there's an extraordinarily complicated textual history to this book, the multiple editions and translations. Some of you who know, know this book know that, which means, interestingly, we all are not reading the same book. For Americans like myself, we're reading the 19, we read most of us the 1924 yeah. English translation that got picked up by Anchor Books and popularized. So I grew up in a very small town and the book was available in the public library. Um, but it was retranslated into English based on the Dutch original. That's probably mostly what you read, but it turns out that was not the Dutch original, but the German uh, second edition. So the editions and translations <laughs> Uh, our, our story in and of themselves. The, the English translation was boulderized, or I should rather say abbreviated, but curiously under, ha uh, under Heisinger's approval. Um, the book is now correctly translated as Autumn, which was a neologism, um, um, poison of a coin, Autumn Tide, Erste, Autumn Tide. 
But it was first translated in French, I believe, and also in English as waning. Curiously, Heusinger decided he preferred that time, waning to autumn, so we used the more correct title, even though Heusinger came to prefer the kind of mistranslation. <laughs> Heusinger was not really a historian. I think this is very relevant. He was a Sanskritist, trained in classical South Asian philology and language. He found that field too remote, too formal, and yet he ended up writing a book, his only book on the Middle Ages, uh, history book on the Middle Ages, as a study, study in forms. Um, the, this was not intended to be a book. It was supposed to be a preface to a study of the Netherlands in the 17th century, which never became a book, but became an essay. So this was a pre preface that became a book, and as Will Willem Altenspeer said very cleverly, his first history book became his last history book. <laughs> Uh, the book had an enormous theoretical uh, impact. We can talk about that today, but Heusinger was not a theorist. He, had, he said he had no serious interest in theory. Instead, he was a great lover of language, of literature, philology. He was a, uh, read extensively literature. Two of his favorite authors uh, were Shakespeare and Hawthorne, the American writer. Um, he is best known, I think, in higher education and social sciences, not for this book, for, for a book called Homo Ludens, Man the Player, as you know, is kind of cheerful 1938 book written in a terrible time of war, all imminent war. Um, and Hoisingo himself was a fairly conservative person culturally. I don't mean politically conservative. He worried a lot about mass culture, cinema, you know, radio, and what that was going to mean. So he's no, no Walter Benjamin or anything like that. Um, and yet he's known as the father of uh, father figure to gamers and programmers, right? His term, the magic circle, is an internet buzzed world, buzz term. So he would have, I think, fully appreciated the irony that, um, that he predicted kind of digital lingo. All right, so, um, so I'm very mindful of time. What is this book about and what is his approach? Well, that's something we'll talk about, but I believe he posed a central question, and that is the question between why is there a gap in this late medieval period of northern France and the southern Low Countries between the quest for what he called a more beautiful life in art, religion, and literature and the chaos and violence of reality. He wanted to understand that gap. I don't know if he ever answered that question, but the book is built around a series of contrasts. Uh, and the assertion is that the Burgundian period is a phenomenon of lateness. And that's something that's very, very interesting. In fact, we had a contribution in our book from a contemporary literary scholar who saw this book as very important to the literary theory of late style. And I learned, I didn't know that Edward Said, who taught here, wrote a book in 2006 called On Late Style. All right, um, the contrastive dimension of the book is found in the language itself that he used. He was a great, a great writer. And, 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 and the use of his Dutch, um, for example, bont, he uses that word a lot, which I think, when we talk to a native speaker, means colorful, uh, yeah. expressive, yeah. and in it, which we were just talking about, is best translated as intimate. And so the book is really built around a, a, those series of contrasts. In my own contribution, I tried to discuss what, why, why I found housing get interesting. Uh, when, I, when I was an undergraduate in history. I read him actually in high school, so I found, this, I found that little book in my public library. But why was I interested in history? Because you know, I, I went to graduate school in the era of the anthropological turn. I studied with a cultural anthropological historian, Richard Trexler, reread this book in seminar, and Heusinger was seen as somebody anticipating the cultural turn, mm -hmm. anticipating the anthropological turn in history. So I was very interested in rereading this book after all these years to see how historians of ritual, court ceremony, uh, cultural studies um, found this book to be um, prescient, right? Uh, and it turned out he did take ritual seriously, but he almost never used the word. Mm -hmm. He used the word ritual twice uh, in the book, so I was disappointed in that, but I was uh, uh, affirmed in my um, sense that he took ritual not as secondary to belief, not as choreographed belief, but truly as an anthropologist says, as a primary social vehicle of expression and form. 
So while he had, a no, he had no explicit theory of ritual, he anticipated a lot of what symbolic anthropologists and late functionalist anthropologists did when they studied ritual in the 60s and 70s. What he was really interested in and what he was very inspired by was early anthropology and primitivism. And he uses primitivism 31 times in this book. In part um, because he was deeply influenced by early, late 19th century armchair anthropology. This is before ethnography, of course, 1919. Especially Edward Bernard Tyler's 1871 Primitive Culture. It, the book sounds a lot also like he read Levé Brule's La Pensée Sauvage, which was published in 1916, but I have no proof of that. What I do have proof of is he formed an epistolary friendship with one of the great mid-20th century anthropologists, Bronislav Malinowski, hmm. and they exchanged letters. Malinowski sent him his three books. Uh, they corresponded, and you can see the impact of Huizinga's serious reading of Malinowski and also his developing interest in anthropology as it developed in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and Huizinga died at the very end of the war, uh, in Homo ludens, which is a mature theory of play, um, uh, ludic behavior. For Huizinga, um, anth the book was really very also influenced by kind of late 19th century German literary criticism, kind of early structuralist studies of universal linguistic and cultural codes. And you see that in his interest in forms, cultural forms, mental forms. And so that interest in formalism uh, also translated into a serious uh, study of ritual. So he got there in, in a number of different ways. But one of the most important, fun, funny things I found is that he didn't anticipate anthropology uh, as it developed in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but as it developed in the 70s, mm -hmm. specifically symbolic anthropology, and it particularly Clifford Geertz. Um, if you think about the fact that his book, on, who, what do we know Geertz for? The cockfight, which is about play, right, Homo ludens, and the theater state, um, which, of course, is what uh, Heusinger studied with the Burgundian court. We appropriated that term, the theater state, to discuss um, the Burgundian court. I think it was Walter Prevenier and Wim Blockmans who were the first one to use it from Geertz, but we really should have attributed it to housing up. The other thing I did in my, I only have a, one more minute left. The other, the, other thing, the only other thing I did in my, in my article was to look at why he made a detour. So he suspended work on this book to write a book on the United States. Man, if translating to English as man and masses. And I won't go into further detail, but I was fascinated by that. And to me, people say that was just a weird sidebar move. Actually, he needed a theory of modernity to write a theory of late medieval uh, alter alterity. And I can discuss that more. So I saw the book as a necessary step to get him to where he arrived with late medieval a late medievalism, but I'll, I'll stop there. We can talk more about it if you want. Thank you. Okay. So good evening to all of you, and uh, thank you, Marta, for your very kind introduction. Now, when looking back on Huizinga's Autumn of the Middle Ages, one cannot but wonder how this very book had influenced historians of all ages. Allow me to start with a personal testimony. When in 1973, roughly 46 years ago, I embarked upon the study of history, I was particularly interested in the social history of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But after one year of study, and above all, after having read Heusinga's Autumn during the summer holiday of 73-74, <laughs> I decided to study the late medieval period, and more precisely the Burgundian period. Huizinga was then not completely unknown to me. In the last year of my secondary study, the teacher of Dutch literature and language had trained us to read and abbreviate texts, one of these texts being the chapter on the images of death, originally chapter 5 from Huizinga's Autumn, a not-so-obvious text to impose on 18-year-old boys, <laughs> but in all its literary exuberance, a text well fitted for the exercise it was meant to illustrate. Mm 
Happily for me, at Ghent University, I encountered Walter Prevenier as my teacher, who I already mentioned. Walter not only had on the wall of his office the reproduction of a drawing of Huizinga and also a self-portrait of Huizinga, who, as we know, was also very gifted for drawing portraits. And when writing my master's and afterwards my PhD under Walter's direction, it became more and more clear how much Huizinga also had meant for him and had provoked his rich and inspiring historical imagination and drive. However, as I discovered when not only studying the history of the late medieval Burgundian Netherlands, but also the history of medieval history writing itself, I discovered that the way Huizinga had treated his subject was by no means an obvious choice. Indeed, as Walter Prevenier again had commented in some of his minor publications, Huizinga's books book was in the eyes of his own professors in Ghent, such as the eminent François Gansov, not considered as an example to follow. <laughs> a recent biography of Gansov by the German uh, scholar Henry Trooper makes clear that Hansoff avoided debate and disagreement with Huizinga, and their exchange was limited to polite exchange, exchanges, a rather strange behavior for two colleagues at work in medieval history in the relatively small Dutch-speaking part of Europe, and indeed a great contrast to the very intense and very friendly exchanges between Henri Piren, Gansoff's master, and Huizinga. Even more telling, a Dutch professor and student of Huizinga, Fritz Hugenholz, who uh, after the Second World War edited uh, the complete works of Huizinga, recorded how when he uh, was studying at Ghent, students were by no means encouraged to read Huizinga's book on the contrary. It illustrates how dominant the old positivist outlook on how history had to be conceived with an almost obsessive impact on the sources and their critical assessment still was. Conventional historians' hostility to Huizinga was even more openly expressed in, for example, the review by Sam Muller, judge uh, archivist, or in the disparaging remarks by the Utrecht professor Otto Oppermann, a perfect example of a suffocating obsession with positivism and auxiliary <laughs> sciences. Now, between Huizinga and Upper, Upperman, the water was indeed very deep, and it remained the case so even with Upperman's pupils. Huizinga himself has his, expressed his view on that kind of history to Piren, on what he characterized as Upperman's hyper-scientific but totally unreadable books. <laughs> <laughs> In doing so, he referred to a quote by the 18th century French philosopher Voltaire, applying it to the scientific output by Opperman and the likes. And he, the quote uh, was that uh, Voltaire, in showing to a visitor in his library the volumes written by the Holy Fathers of the Church, commented, I have read them all, but they will pay me back for that. <laughs> <laughs> Je les ai lus, ils me le payeront. <laughs> Although his colleagues may have been indifferent or even hostile, the general public, and on the contrary, seemed to have loved the book from the beginning. At least, if we measure that by the number of reprints and of positive general reviews. During Huizinga's life alone, five editions were published in Dutch, five in German, three in English and in Italian, only one in Spanish, Swedish, Hungarian and most remarkably only one in French, although the book treated expressively, if you look at the subtitle, on the French uh, and Francophone uh, culture. Yet the translations have not always paved the way for an adequate comprehension of the text as conceived by its author, and that's what uh, uh, Peter gave us some examples of that. This has been notably the fate of many of Huizinga's later books as an impressive public success combined with a lesser or more precisely a late impact in the world of historians. In one of the chapters of this book, uh, the book we present today, Miriam Grelsamer has argued how even the Annal historians, whom we might suspect to be close to Huizinga's way of dealing with history, did not recognize until very late how much Huizinga had been a forerunner of what became known as the Histoire des Mentalités. Indeed, one had to wait for Jacques Le Goff's endorsement of 1977 to have the analysts fully embrace the book. <laughs> 
Of course, this can be explained by French historians' difficulty in recognizing that brilliant new ideas can emerge outside of the 5th or 6th <laughs> arrondissement of Paris. <laughs> How can we explain the mixed reactions to Heisinghaus's book? In part, it is due to his restricted focus. Rather than examining all of society, he concentrated on elite culture, thus ignoring the cities and the commercial world that surrounded and that had made that culture happen. He concentrated on the official narrative sources produced by the equally official historiographers at work at the court of Burgundy. But of course, as I hope many chapters of the rereading book, uh, rereading Heusinger book make clear, these were deliberate choices, and they did not prevent the production of a challenging and most innovative book. And finally, as Henri Piren himself remarked in his abundant discussions with Heusinger, il y a some plusieurs vérités pour la même chose. There are, in short, many truths for the same thing. It is a little as in painting a question of lightning. The essential thing is to force careful reflection, end of quote. Heusinger also wrote as provocatively about his own period, in particular in the book In the Schaduw van Morgen, In the Shadow of Tomorrow, a book published in 1936, a diagnosis, so runs the subtitle, of the spiritual distemper of our time. Or the book for which he is nowadays best known, thanks to the importance of the game industry, Homo Ludens, a study of the play element and culture, 1938. It is clear that we are dealing with a historian who, as he wrote in his autobiographical and posthumously published text, Mein Weg tot de Historie, in English, my path to history, though the English word history does not render all nuances that the word history has in Dutch, had come to history almost by accident. He remained in his own word an amateur, who had been, and there I translate, but I will read it in the original version too, as gliding over the garden of the spirit, while from time to time tipping on its flowers before continuing one's path, end quote. And indeed, he concludes with what sounds almost as a confession. In the tightly closed guilt of philologists and historians, where rules and strict orders have to be respected, I never felt at home. Before concluding, I had to use the language of our old friars of the common life, received a little spark, which from time to time was able to glow. Heusinga, and Peter has uh, stressed that rightly, uh, was very attentive to language and to the aesthetic aspects of his text. And so allow me to conclude, I think there are uh, probably some people who may uh, follow this, uh, this uh, presentation by reading this last paragraph in the original Dutch version of 1947, so in its autobiographical text, and I even have the original edition with me. Het werk dat achter mij ligt en dat hoe dan ook spoedig afgelopen zal zijn, is voor mijn eigen gevoel nooit meer geweest dan het zweven over de tuinen van den geest, een hier en daar tippen aan de bloesems en dan meteen weer verder gaan. Intensieve geestelijke inspanning heb ik nauwelijks gekend. In het streng gesloten gilde van de filologen en geschiedvorsers, waar de reglementen gelden en de voorschriften moeten worden nageleefd, heb ik mij nooit thuis gevoeld. Ik had, om in de taal van onze oude Windesheimers te spreken, maar een vonkje ontvangen dat af en toe wel gloeien wilde. End quote. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me for this. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance for my Dutch pronunciation, <laughs> which will be the first non-professional Dutch pronunciation you've heard so far. Uh, also, I, I lured a lot of students here with the promise of being amusingly autobiographical, and Mark already took that approach. Uh, and I thought I'd be different by having props, and he had a prop, but I have more props. Than <laughs> he has. Uh, so this is what you're going to you're going to get. So I first encountered uh, housing as waning of the Middle Ages, and I'll refer to it uh, that way because that's how I learned it, waning rather than autumn. In the fall of 1986, in my introduction to the Middle Ages course, and the main required books on the syllabus were Georges Duby, Age of the Cathedrals, 
David Knowles, Evolution of Medieval Thought, and Richard Southern, Making of the Middle Ages. Oh, yes. okay, yeah. <laughs> and while the assignments for those books were spread out over the term, Housinger was listed just under the antepenultimate lecture by Louis Dupré, of all people, on disintegration of the medieval synthesis without page numbers. Apparently, we were supposed to read the whole thing. <laughs> uh, the lecture itself, if my notes, which I still have, are to be trusted, was entirely about intellectual history. Marsilius of Padua, William of Ockham, Joachim of Fiore, although my notes, predictably, in retrospect, uh, seem to focus more on the political framework. Housinga was not mentioned. It didn't make much of an impression. Uh, that may have been because it came at the end of the term or it may have been because my aesthetic preferences even then leaned toward the Romanesque. Burgundian Gothic still makes me a little nervous. Uh, here is the artifact itself. Uh, in con now, in contrast to my copy of the new translation, this is not my copy, but uh, there is no evidence that I ever even opened this. <laughs> there are no annotations. There are no dog-eared pages. There is not the slightest crack in the spine. Not that anyone will ever do this after I am long gone, but if someone went through my library in the manner that Graham Small and Anton van der Lem uh, did for Housinga and their superb articles in the volume that we are celebrating here, they would find, on the other hand, in... <laughs> My modestly annotated copy of Southern from that course, by contrast, on page 118, next to the citation of the 9th century Catalan count Wifred the Hairy, my <laughs> manuscript remark, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> As some in the audience will know, I am now essentially a professor of Wifred the Hairy studies. <laughs> Who knows what would have happened if I had had, had a similar reaction to housing as equally worthy page 118 with its discussion of the Roman de la Rose and its statement that, quote, young girls should sell their persons early and dearly. <laughs> but while Housinger was certainly on the syllabus, he was peripheral to it and may have been included simply because it was available as a cheap double-day paperback at $5.95. Yeah. Now, I am perhaps not the best person to talk about the place of Housinger's book in the field of medieval history in that if there is an opposite to cultural historian of the late medieval low countries, it is arguably institutional historian of early and high medieval Iberia. Uh, I see Joel Kay in the back there and he may have been a, a better choice, but he's in the room and we will draw on him. Anyway, so my approach here was to start pulling things, things from my shelves. <laughs> I found, for instance, and this is a challenge to something that you said, I found a, a curious volume of medieval history syllabi from the mid-1980s. Wow. And out of the 50 syllabi in here, only three listed housing in any capacity, none as a main textbook. A course on the late Middle Ages, a course on Capetian and early Valois France, and a course on medieval personalities in a subsection on Joan of Arc. Then there's a three volume set, <laughs> brought one entitled Medieval Scholarship Biographical Studies on the Formation of a Discipline. In the volume on history, which starts with the Balandists and runs through the historian of medieval Islam, Gustav von Grunebaum, Housinga doesn't merit one of the 23 chapters. Indeed, he is mentioned only once in passing in the entire volume in the chapter on Piren. He also doesn't get a chapter in the second volume on the arts, where one could plausibly put him, or in the third volume on literature and philology. So according to this project, very substantial project, Housinga does not make it into the top 23 medieval historians or even the top 75 medievalists of all time. <laughs> A similar biographical project started in 2005, uh, run out of Spain, rewriting the Middle Ages in the 20th century. Housinga did not make the cut in the first volume, which had 19 chapters. He does get a chapter in the second volume, sandwiched between Edgar, Edgar de Bruyne and Mehmed Fouad Kuprolu, the former probably known to this audience, the latter certainly not. Uh, and what an odd chapter it is, authored by a Catalan art historian, 
It is less a study of Hausinger than a study of what the shelf locations of Hausinger's <laughs> books in the library of the Warburg Institute tell us about the logic of the library of the Warburg Institute. <laughs> now, the scholarly seriousness of the volume that we are celebrating here is proven by the fact that even this bit of relative arcana is cited in the chapter by Diane Wolfgall on Hausinger <laughs> and art history. Right? Then I tried a German volume that I like uh, by Hans Werner Goetz from 1999 on contemporary medieval studies. Part one is devoted to the development of the discipline. Hausinger is mentioned once in a cita citation not to waning of the Middle Ages, but to an article on the history of the concept of the Middle Ages. Then I thought I should get serious. So I did a full text search of the Lexicon des Mittelalters, <laughs> which as my students in the audience know has an ex excellent short essential bibliographies at the end of each of its 36,700 articles on various bits of medieval history. Surely Housinga's impact could be measured here. That search revealed that he shows up in a grand total of 14 of those bibliographies, or 0.03%. These were for articles on behavior, Burgundy, Christian year, classical antiquities, death, Dietrich of Altena Isenberg, <laughs> Domburg, games, Harlem, Handlungen, I don't know why it's the one thing in German, Handlungen, <laughs> Knights and Knighthood, Renaissance, and the Turlupins. That last one, I confess, I had to look up. It's a heretical sect. Now, granted, there's a German and an institutional historical bent to this reference work, but still, that's a very small number of hits for 37,000 articles. Piren has 41, Ganshoff has 91. At this point, I was getting desperate. So I put on my rubber gloves, and I reached for Norman Cantor's Inventing the Middle Ages, oh. <laughs> whose essential point as those hypothetical future scholars of my library will discover in my annotations, seems to have been that everyone relevant in 20th century medieval history of medieval studies was either Jewish, a Nazi, or both. <laughs> <laughs> that last category has just one entry, Ernst Kantorowicz, on whom more in a moment. Housinga, one of the few non-Jewish non-Nazis, but <laughs> since everything is read through Nazis, he gets labeled here as a fierce anti-Nazi patriot, right? Hausinger nevertheless gets a few pages, in large part because he left an autobiography. And here, finally, in Cantor, we find the influence that we might have expected. Waning is, quote, one of the classic books on medieval history, one of the all-time best-selling books on medieval history, likely to appear on anyone's list of the 10 best books ever written on medieval history. And a plausible argument would place it near the top alongside Southern's Making of the Middle Ages and Bloch's Feudal Society on the list of paperback hits in an American bookstore. But, Cantor, it concludes, housing us stands alone and remote from the ongoing dialogues in medieval studies. Now, Cantor has a characteristic for Cantor, explanation for Housinger's reception. The genre in which Housinger wrote, quote, has always made professional historians and art historians very uneasy. If anyone with a sharp mind and a few standard books, accessible, as he notes, in any second-rate college library, can write an important book of humanistic interpretation, the academic guild, right, uh, behind its defensive walls of immense learning and privileged behavior is threatened out of its core livelihood. <laughs> this, of course, and typically tells us more about Norman Cantor than about housing, of, but the problem remains. Not many medieval history books merit edited volumes celebrating the centenary of their publication, but evidence for influence and impact is scant in exactly the places where one might expect to find them. What is going on? A couple of years ago, uh, this, is a, this is a productive tangent. A couple of years ago, I got into an interesting debate with Robert Lerner after I reviewed his brilliant biography of Ernst Kantorowicz. And I wrote, quoting myself, <laughs> Lerner's only real false step is his claim that Kantorowicz, quote, remains one of the most influential of all medieval historians, perhaps the most influential, even with his concession, um, this is me writing, that Perrin, Bloch, Southern, Haskins, and Strayer might count as equally great. Despite the Foucault-inspired publishing success of The King's Two Bodies from the 1970s, this claim to influence, says Costo, is simply not true, whether in terms of carving out a new field of study, even in the fields Kantorowicz is most associated with, the work of Percy Ernst Schramm, actually a member of the Nazi party, mm -hmm. better deserves that claim, or in training a generation of students, he had precious few, however loyal, or positing a historic historiography-dominating thesis, 
His greatest work famously has no real argument and is sui generis. Now, uh, end of Costo quote, Lerner's counter argument was K2B, that by the way, next time you're texting someone about Kantorowicz's book, King's Two Bodies, K2B <laughs> is how you know. <laughs> K2B, he writes, is cited in incessantly in a range of studies, running from art to literature to politics to theory, and sometimes approvingly and sometimes argumentatively. I, Robert Lerner, wager that a digital citation test would have K2B swamping the works of Strayer and all the others taken together. So this debate between me and Lerner clearly comes down to defining influence. What does influence mean? For him, it was citation, it was publication. And the fact that the book keeps getting reprinted, uh, Kantorowicz's book, most recently in 2017, corresponding, surely not coincidentally, with the publication of Lerner's biography of Kantorowicz. Uh, uh, now, for me, however, it wasn't citations, it was carving out a new field of study, training a generation of students, positing a historiography-dominating thesis. And as I was reading this really wonderful collection of essays, uh, the parallels between my Kantorowicz problem and the housing problem became apparent. There are, of course, all sorts of interesting parallels one can draw between Housinga and Kantorovich, despite the different milieu. Both, as has been already mentioned, wrote, or hasn't been mentioned, but both wrote dissertations not in medieval history, but in orientalistique. Mm -hmm. Both wrote books with Latin titles, Laudis Regia and Homo Ludens, that are arguably better than their most famous ones. Both were stylistic outsiders, both were dazzling, dazzlingly interdisciplinary, both experienced a bump in popularity because of favorable mentions by famous French scholars in the <laughs> 1970s, and so on. Uh, the the um, Ed Peters and Walter Seaman's article in uh, Speculum, yeah. 1999, has a very nice footnote on, on these parallels. Kind of speculative, but it, speculative, but interesting. But I want to I want to get back to this question of influence. Right? As has been mentioned, uh, Miriam Greilsamer's article uh, mm -hmm. in the volume notes that Waning of the Middle Ages really only took off as a great book, in the academy at least, with the rise of cultural history in the 1970s and positive mentions by Jacques Le Goff and uh, Philippe Perriez, uh, a chronology that seems confirmed elsewhere in the volume. A full text search of the journal Speculum that I did more or less supports this mm -hmm. chronology, right? This take off in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the question then is what to do uh, what you do with a great book whose impact is only apparent decades later. And my sense, and I may be wrong, is that the pioneers of cultural and, cult and anthropologically inspired history were not so much influenced by Housinga in the sense of his work being an Aristotelian efficient cause as they saw in Housinga an earlier kindred spirit, right? A forerunner, but not in a relay race. An anticipation, not a first link in a chain. References are, uh, as they were in my syllabus from 1986, more optional than required. Uh, you should take note of this book. It's good. It's great even, but you can actually pass the course without reading it. <laughs> Which is, in a way, how I view, in my own field, Kantorowicz's King's Two Bodies. Yeah. Right? It's one of my favorite books of medieval history, certainly in the top three. But when I tried to find Kantorovich cited in my own published work, it only popped up once, mm. and it was a reference not to Ernst Kantorovich, but to the legal historian Hermann Kantorovich, <laughs> who I think was his cousin. And the sort of work that I do in legal and institutional history is about as far from Kantorovich, Kantorovich's in approach as it could be while still inhabiting the same general field. <laughs> The King's Two Bodies and Kantorovich's article certainly influenced my professional formation. I, I wanted, but very quickly gave up on the idea uh, to have read as, wi as widely as Kantorovich obviously had. And one could tie my tendency to produce pages overflowing with ostentatious footnotes to my odd early encounters with Kantorovich's work. But without hearing this directly from me, it would be very hard for someone to connect uh, my work with his work. And that's what, where I'm left thinking about the question of housing uh, and medieval history. Everyone in the field knows the book, even if they have not read it in a while or ever. But it's hard to connect the dots. <laughs> Thank you. This is going to follow, actually, I think, much as if we planned this. So one of my favorite quotations about the book is this French quotation that um, calls housing a, both a master of error and an open arm um, And that it is precisely that dynamic, which is 
it is so remarkable in the book and in the edited volume we're celebrating today, it is, is brought into the light, precisely that balance. And um, I, uh, I, since we're doing autobiography, my encounter was this copy, which was a, uh, which I picked up for 50 cents in the basement of the, the Harvard uh, undergraduate library. It was with Vaughn copy, I did not steal it. Um, <laughs> it was the ninth copy of many that they had in the Ruger library. It was somehow no longer needed. And it is densely annotated and argumentatively so. So for example, uh, one person says something about uh, uh, superstition, a student writes something, another student writes something, and then someone writes in pencil, horse manure. Um, <laughs> so there's a way in which one could actually do sort of, we could actually, if we started collecting these volumes, had our libraries all not covered, but we could do something. <laughs> now, I wanted to know, what is it you do if you're teaching yeah. with a master of error and an opener of doors? And uh, I didn't know that Adam had the sort of secret sauce of the medieval syllabi of the past. But um, it turns out there's an or a group that was based here at Columbia called OpenSyllabus.org. And what they did is collect a vast number of Anglophone, exclusively syllabi as far as I know. And you can look up a vast number of works and see who is using them and in what sort of things and in conjunction with what other works. Um, and so I just looked this up this morning. And, uh, and what you can see here is that to this day, the Wayne of the Middle Ages remains important on syllabi across a number of fields. Um, it may be too small to see, but you have history, French, English literature, fine arts, film and photography, and linguistics. Now, the data here isn't enough to say whether it's like the syllabus that Adam was referring to, yeah. it's thrown off, or whether it's serious engagement, and that would be something else we have to do. But it really makes us wonder about how if we take the vices of the book, mm -hmm. and these are laid out unsparingly um, in the volume, but not only, that's not the only thing the volume does, and if you read many of the secondary literature, this is all they do in a mindless kind of way. The failure to consult sources like we're supposed to, infantilize medieval period, I never saw a problem with that one, but in any case, um, <laughs> very hard to instrumentalize, not scientific, it's, if it's hermeneutic, it's a black box. Um, and more sophisticated one, like Peter, it, 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 it helps us think about him as a non-systematic kind of theoretical thinker. So what's going on? Why are people teaching vice-ridden things? <laughs> now, I'm in the very rare set of historians who actually loves to teach all the books that we think are wrong, but that open up our minds. And this often horrifies the graduate students who've been taught not to believe this, and that Professor Jones is going to do this, and, they're gonna, and their advisors will tell them otherwise. And this is just that kind. Book. Now, in this, um, in this uh, open syllabus thing, we can see the kinds of books that it is taught with. And I'll just show you this very quickly, and you can look it up. So here in uh, a network graph, this is you know, a big deal right now in the digital humanities, we can see the waning of the Middle Ages. And roughly, just to orient yourself, the purple spot above it is Renaissance and Reformation. Oh. Um, to the uh, south, uh, yeah, the, 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 the south um, southwest is medieval historical scholarship, um, and the southeast is roughly speaking um, uh, medieval literature. And it's quite extraordinary what you what you find in this sort of thing. You find it most closely connected to Baudet, right? Precisely another book that angers everyone because it is the you know the epitome of wrongness. Um, a very huge thing next to it is the Prince. Yeah. Uh, my own former colleague, Carolyn Bynum's extraordinary book, Holy Feast and Holy Fast, another transformative book that changes your life. <laughs> Books like White's Medieval Technology and Social Change, um, Moore's Formation of a Persecuting Society, I could go on and on. And in fact, if you want to do this yourself, um, you can do it in, in real time. So, uh, so you can see, well here he is, I didn't even notice this, close to Montaigne, <laughs> Rodel, uh, making sense. You want to talk about a book that's full of error? Um, <laughs> uh, et cetera. Okay, so what am, I, what am I doing this? Well, I just want to talk about like, why on earth are my colleagues teaching books through full of vices? And why would I happily do that? Um, what are the virtues of this particular book? So I think, and, and as and Martha and Peter and others have mentioned, this is a book that it, it students are challenged by. It's easy to read in some sense, but they don't know what to make of it. 
And the first question a history graduate student nervous in the classroom, thinking that what they need to do is understand what are the conditions under which you would cite the right kind of literature to produce this book is, like what is this sort of thing? What are its citational practices? And that's not a conversation that's gonna be the most productive thing. Um, for all the reasons. What is productive is a lot of odd moments that challenge us as historians. So one of my favorites, and I find this maddening, he tells us the literature of the 15th century, with the exception of only a few poets, fatigues and bores us. Now, that doesn't fit anywhere in the domain of a thinkable thought for a professional historian. <laughs> like, we literally can't think of that. And yet, he wants us to do that. And to say, that's not only a passing sort of thing, but it's something that we need to understand the conditions under which that could possibly be. What is it that would produce that sort of thing? And the book is filled with moments of challenge to students. And it's the, the clear writing style and the elegance of its prose belies the challenges that it constantly gives us. He's constantly beating us over the head about our errors in historical thought, about the dangerous errors and the failure to have explanation, the demand that we, as he says, we have to transpose ourselves. And this, is in some sense what overcomes, in many, I think, we can understand the vices that are very clear and laid out in that book. And it's indeed here is where he is literally an opener of doors. And the volume that we're celebrating tonight, rightly so, so beautifully captures this. If you want to understand at once the vices and yet the many virtues of this, uh, I commend to you many of the essays. So, Professor Boone, um, he says, an extraordinary invocation not just of the historiographic situation, but a reminder of in the way in which the kind of confidence in national history that most of his contemporaries had makes, you know, it, it was one of the largest historiographical mistakes one could ever imagine. It once that has polluted our politics for a century, but has made us see poorly, even the most positive of us among us. Um, similar things might be said in, a, in the 1972 volume, um, which included sort of an extraordinary array of figures. Um, talking about the book was, I would say, with less attention, in fact, um, to the text. So as you read the volume that we're talking about today, what you learn is some of the things we've talked about, ways that the, this text has anticipated newer moves in historiography. But there's an undertone that I think is important, is that it's never reducible to those things. It's not Gertzian anthropology. It's not the more reductionist form of, an all, uh, uh, of, of a more materialist in all history. It's not the things we want it to be, right? It's always, in some sense, less than that and more. It is more than that because it challenges us about all these modes of historical explanation and uh, modes of what it is that we ask of history. Um, and so I, I, I'll just sort of, I would suggest that that's a way that, uh, that we can draw upon the work of the assembled volume in thinking about why we teach this kind of book and the way we teach it while teaching vices and yet the key openings it has. Um, so as I said, he's keen, he's constantly reminding us of our errors in thought along the way. And this is one of my favorites, um, because I'm not the kind of historian, though that appeals to me. Uh, historians who prefer to rely as much on possible and official documents because the chronicles are unreliable, fall thereby victim to an occasional dangerous error. This is why the chronicles, no matter how superficial, they may be with respect to the actual facts, and no matter how often they err in the reporting facts, are indispensable if we want to understand that age correctly. This is a moment of challenging the positivism that we hardwire into students and then demand a different kind of positivism. Because it's a positivism in which many of the attributes of the Chronicles need explanation. We need to take them into account. We need to deal with them. It is likewise, he notes, that those who think that an age can be comprehended its entire reality through art leave a general era of historical criticism uncorrected. Again, in the middle of a book, so much of which is centered on the art, he's underscoring the danger of that. And then likewise, he constantly reminds us of the weaknesses of many of our explanations. Now, as I said before, though 
the, the kinds of explanations that he's interested in do foreshadow many moments in 20th century historiography, but they're never quite the same. And it's that gap that's so interesting. In particular, he was, he was as, 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 as many of the other speakers have mentioned, he was very skeptical of the, the, the study of economic life and, 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 and the ways in which people would do it, and particularly of reduction to it. Anyone who studies the history of that period, he noted, will be shocked at the inadequacy of the efforts of modern historians to explain these parties in terms of economic, political causes. Again, this is at once foreshadowing, but more importantly foreshadowing, it's a reminder to challenge us and our students about the adequacy of different forms of explanation. And so why I think this book belongs on the syllabus, despite, is that it's, it's a, really a moment to see how a text that is not cast in a rich, theori in, a, in a dense theoretical vocabulary, is in sense a legible text, is not at all, uh, you know, it is not at all something that is outside of the guild of historians, but pushes against the complacency that we have. The kinds of solutions to problems of historical knowledge, the positivist one of his day, um, as well as some of the, the canons today, and to the disciplinary training. So it's a wonderful text to be precisely critical of the disciplinary training, which I think Adam so beautifully evoked. And its normative frame is powerful, and here I'll end. He demands constantly a radical historicization of things that we would not think to historicize. Um, or now, some of them we would. Some of them, and when he wrote less so. And he provides explications. Most of those explications were in hollow. But their failure is all the more powerful. Because it demands more of us as historians. And it demands that we be far more critical of the way we use sources and our complacency about the kind of causal stories that we are wanting to get. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, I'm going to open it up to us for just a moment, but then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. And I wonder if any of us, uh, Peter or Mark or Adam or Matt or I, have comments that we want to sort of get you to develop things a bit more. I have a comment, but I'm going to hold it and let you go. I'm going to, given the time, I'm going to throw it up to the audience. I, okay. I have a lot to say, but I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nobody has anything pressing up here? Okay. Well, we're going to open it up to you all for questions, comments. Yes. Well, on, on the point of influence, just as a personal anecdote, this is one of the books that I can remember from when I, my freshman year in yeah. 1968. It's such a luminous, wonderful book in the introduction to history, which you don't know anything. But my, my question is I wonder if some of the lack of um, or the slowness of influence comes from the tendency that Augustine talks about in the Netherlands, or that culture, I guess, to kind of decapitate the great man and, and not, not to celebrate greatness. You want to address that, Mark? No. You want to take that, Mark? No. What? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll try. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, Go first. One yeah. of the interesting things for me is I'm, I'm told and my own anecdotal experience confirms it is. The book isn't read in, in universities in the Netherlands. Um, it's, it's read in the Anglophone world, and now I think increasingly the Francophone world. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was a, a hit on undergraduate syllabi, even the Adam notwithstanding. In, in good Evid history, positive course, evidence <laughs> notwithstanding. <laughs> yes. No, I take your point. <laughs> uh, it was in my college experience, you read it. You oh. took a survey course on the Middle Ages and you read Hashing and you didn't understand it. But it was, it was fun to read, beautiful to read, and we read The Little Waning of the Middle Ages, the cheap uh, version. And uh, so I. My, my sense is that the book in the Netherlands isn't, um, at the time, as Miriam Geisheimer's piece in the volume explains, at the time medieval history was just in its, in, the, the profession of medieval history writing was just in its infancy in the, in the Netherlands. And they were not interested in a book that broke all the rules. Yeah, I think on the point, I'm not, Dutch, obviously, and Mark isn't either. Um, um, but I think Alta Spears was on to something in saying the Dutch, I think he used clip the wings in the English translation. Uh -huh. And Laura, who's 
your daughter is, my youngest daughter is here, my youngest daughter is here, but I noticed I wrote a book on the Dutch Revolt, and a lot of it had to do with William of Orange, that's fatherland history, and I was stunned that the Dutch threw out patriotic history and didn't replace it. Mm -hmm. So I was working on William of Orange, because that's such an old-fashioned topic where he's a, a sick of saint worship, a major, the, one of the major figures. And so there, there was this tendency that I saw, I see in the Netherlands, I haven't seen in other European countries to do this. Hmm. But maybe I'm wrong about this. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. With glorious pictures, like yes. pictures, which makes the text much more understandable. Yes. Mm. I've heard from Anton from Milan, who was the editor of the volume, that it sounds like hotcakes. Yes. My question, of course, is: Is it lead or is it a copy date book? And is it a uh, symptom, a, a symptom mm. of the Me Too? You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm intelligent. <laughs> yeah, one of one of the aspects maybe why it is not that much read over the years in in in, uh, in the Netherlands itself is that the language is very much outdated. Yeah. The Dutch language is a language that evolves uh, very strongly, and and what could explain the success of of the last edition is that Anton van der Lem took the effort to to. to to write it in actual Dutch, to rewrite it, <laughs> the, the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, did he? Uh, the, the old uh, it's way a of... Uh, it's a Dutch translation from the Dutch. No, <laughs> well, you, no, you can't call that uh, a translation, but it's, it's, okay. it's brought up to the standards of how Dutch is now written. Hmm. Spelling. Well, the spelling, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but that's, that for students, the old spelling is really a wall, huh? The, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Brigitte. Well, I would like to begin by confirming the French um, problem with the Ecole des Social and, and, and the fashion which was that when I was French, I didn't hear the truth in that. But the minute I came to this country, my husband was a Colombian graduate, he immediately said, what? <laughs> I never read. So I immediately hmm. did. And I remember an aesthetic experience of reading, something that gives me enormous fear. But to go back to your issue of challenge, it didn't particularly challenge me because I didn't want to judge it. Mm. And therefore, I would like to compare things again to a, a, a kind of a, not a bet noir, but somebody who is important for me, Italy's, is the Czech of Burkhardt, who also is associated with a kind of a pre cultural mm -hmm. form of history and, and method, but provided materialist with something to push against. And whether it's the individual or particular mm -hmm. individual, using that in some ways produces a picture that uh, was a little bit like a swan song from a medievalist, mm -hmm. something that perhaps we didn't want to touch. So I just wonder is it's not that there's no um, argument in, in the way, in, but there is no argument in some ways, and therefore it doesn't challenge the way. I mean, I, I'll just say about Burkhardt. I also, I'm, I'm someone who regularly teaches Burkhardt in classes on the Renaissance, and I spend a lot of time reminding that um, almost none of it would be accepted by my medievalist colleagues. Um, and, uh, but in, in Burkhardt, um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot that we could say, but it's, it's also one of these great books that is greatly and profoundly wrong and very yes. instructive. Right. But it is yeah. profoundly schematic. Right. Like yes. It is a book that is everywhere schematic and intelligible yeah. and designed to be. Um, and if it's working in you know, a really sort of roughly speaking Hegelian space, um, once the students see that, it is therefore, it, it is precisely the lack of color that you see in Burkhardt that is why this book is, in some, uh, Heisinger is much more challenging. Mm -hmm. Because what it is that is happening both at the level of what is to be explained and is what is, and, and they doing the explaining that is far more elusive, but I would actually say more, um, uh, I actually think it's more challenging in, in many ways. But it, 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 these, uh, these are clearly books that um, 
uh, that are, are in their wrongness profoundly important and their distinctive genres of this. There's other books like Foucault's Order of Things, you know, almost completely and entirely wrong in the first 90 pages, and yet profoundly useful for students um, to read. Uh, and incidentally, I just got an email from Adam Costa's undergraduate institution, and unfortunately, they've had to withdraw his BA degree. From that. <laughs> <laughs> I got a 96 on the final, so I have that too. <laughs> B minus on the paper, though, so that was... <laughs> But it, it, it right. is interesting, Matt, what you said about Burkhardt. Burkhardt is very easy to teach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And housing is hard to teach. Uh, and somehow, you know, the, this workshop that we did and this volume is going to be mm. very helpful. But w one of the things I'm afraid of is that we're going to take that book, which I was just rereading it uh, in anticipation for tonight, because I haven't reread it until we had that workshop a couple of years ago. Uh, it's beautiful. It's just a wonder yeah. to read. Um, and Burkhart, he has his moments, but basically, it's a slog. Well, I mean, it's also, I mean, I didn't, until I reread it, because I read it as a student, I read it in high school actually, too. Um, it's unlike Burkhart, there's references to. You know, Vedic texts and Vedic texts and the Salvation Army and chivalry, knighthood as male puberty rituals. And I mean, there's no other medieval history book in 1919 like it. Right. 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 I mean, it's right. so sui generis. We've been talking about that. But I missed all that the first time I read it. Of I don't, course. Because you're trying to figure out what's going on. We don't, yeah, you don't know what's going and on. And is there going to be a test? Right. You know? No, I mean, you know, what are you supposed to say? And we read, we, most of us in the, you know, English-speaking world read the abridged paperback yes. that you pulled out, mm -hmm. which is not the text, but curiously that he approved. Yeah. So, I, you know, you could say it's boulderized, except he approved it. He approved the translation. And he said, I like the title better. Yeah. Pamela. Pamela, yes. Wait a minute, you need a... Yeah, I do. Um, Who actually it? Was there a preface that would give us Yeah, there is all that, yeah. Well, Adam, yeah, I don't have No, no, but you know better. Well, so. no, I don't actually, I, I haven't done the deep dive on the, uh, yes, and I, there's, a, there's a long review article in Speculum. This is not a yeah, review, yeah, there's an article by Walter Sue. And, and that's, it, half, the, half the text is about the history of the editions and so forth. So it, the, the American and English versions were all the 1924 translation. Uh, which he approved. It did, did come with a, a preface. The, the tragic thing, it, the ironic thing, or the stupid thing, <laughs> is that when, when the University of Chicago Press put out what was supposed to be the definitive translation of the original text, it was Walter Siemens, who was a Dutch you know, uh, speaker, native speaker, who realized the translators, neither of whom were historians, were using the second German edition yeah. and yeah. not the Dutch original. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. left many of the footnotes in German that had been translated into German <laughs> for the translation, thinking that Hoisinger was citing original sources. In German. But, but, but even the first chapter is mistitled. Yeah. Um, so Anton did produce, Wanderlim, did come out with this gorgeous book, which Laura mentioned. But what's happening right now is it's, they're, they're finally retranslating the original from the Dutch. Yeah, yeah. So the new edition will be translated in English. Or whether they're, that matters or they're not. They're working on it now. Yeah. But that wasn't your question, I guess, or your point. No, I, I mean, I was asking that in order to try to understand why it became such a bestseller. Because it's not just that it's the only thing that happened. It showed that. Anchor, anchor Press, the so cheap Livre de I think I mean, somebody, is some it, did it get picked up by the Book of the Month Club? Oh, Book of the Month Club, that was it. It got p picked up by the Book of the Month Club. Yeah. And that just, like, w now why it got done, I don't know. There's probably a great history of who was making the selections, but being picked up, by the, picked up by the Book of the Month Club meant that it was going to be everywhere. But I don't know. Uh, oh, you have a footnote. Is that in the family, Apparently, my father says, but everybody said, why did he ever allow the English and um. the American translation to be, to be a different shortage? That my father said, 
oh, the Americans won't have the patience to read the whole Bible. <laughs> 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 that was in the family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was what I thought was. I don't know. I, think, I suspect that it was read uh, in colleges. I mean, we all read this in college, right? Mm. But it, I mean, it's been translated recently into Korean, yeah. Chinese, and Japanese. So it continue. So the huge Asian market, uh, right. which I find very interesting. Um, so you know, it's still it's still being translated. But it seems like it is now a classic, right? But yeah. The thing is, it didn't start out that no. way. So the question no, is, no, you're right. right. I mean, I think to really understand that story would be to get into the. A history that a lot of people are doing right now of, um, you know, uh, highbrow but legible historical writing that you know Penguin in the UK and other yeah. sorts of presses that were such an important part of publication for professional historians well into um, late into the 20th century and the d dissolving of that market, which is usually attributed to say us bad historians stopping to write about popes and mm -hmm. presidents, um, but was something else meant that that whole range of, of books, now I think to, you know, there's a really serious in problem in the intellectual history, is how do we understand the relationship of that and the development of the historical profession, right. given that what Adam did, if we did at scale, would mm -hmm. probably be very similar, mm -hmm. and yet would systematically probably um, completely miss exactly. the impact of this book. Now, what that impact would be, it, as Martha says, and is this, this is generations of Harvard undergraduates struggling with the book, um, and actually doing a very a set of annotations that are very wise. Um, uh, to do that history would be some serious work, and it would be serious work about what the intellectual history of our profession looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and we have not done, no one has done that yeah. work yet. But I think, Adam, you were right to, to twin the book with The King's Two Bodies, Kantorovich's mm -hmm. book, which tracks similarly but different of course differently I and mean, it was never abridged right i mean but we all read it in the big fat one we all had to read we it we all read it we didn't understand uh, no we didn't understand it at all you know it, it's uh, no yeah Oh, I don't know. I think, I'm sure, I'm sure there's some marketing story about why this was only got on college syllabuses in the United States, but I suspect it also had something to do with teachers recognizing that this book was telling a different story. Mm -hmm. A story that the way we were writing history, the way Adam outlines, you know, in this sort of institutional, political, blah, 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 uh, missed. And so this was a kind of a fill in the gap book in some teacher's mind that you wait a minute, let's let's stop for a minute and look at the, the, this behavior and this belief system and what is it they thought they were doing. I remember even when I read the book in college, that's how I interpreted it. Oh, this is looking at the Middle Ages from a different lens. It's turning the lens. And the t you know, it wasn't that we analyzed it, it was sort of a a book that you didn't analyze, you just reacted to. Well, we know why it was being taught from the 70s on, right. the late 70s on. The question, before. the question is, was the, when this was circulating in cheap paperbacks in the 60s and earlier, were there paperbacks in the 50s yeah. of this sort? Was that being taught in colleges or no? That, I don't, I was, don't know was, the answer. Was it just a, a general public rather than on syllabi. If we had syllabi from the 1950s and the 1960s, would it be on there? I don't well, think so. I don't think so. I don't get done. No. We might have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> I went to Columbia College from 1966 ah, okay. to 1970. <laughs> and I was taught, I was told, and did, that we Burkhart, Isinga, mm. and the Prince all that you've been mentioned. <laughs> yeah. okay. And I noticed that tonight, earlier today, I went over the Wikipedia page for, for the Wing of the Middle Ages, which references only one book that I remember, which is Burkhart, tying them together in terms of some similarity they had. But my memories of those books are later encountering, uh, I took an Italian course at Barnard, and Somehow it came out that we had read Burkhardt, and the Italian professor said, that's incredible. It doesn't have any valueless history at all, but you should, I guess, be aware of it to show the problems of historiography. And then later, uh, a Dutch professor, uh, Jakob Wim uh, Smith, Jim Smith. Taught here for yeah. time, uh, told us that, yes, I think it was the most important 
Felder in his lifetime, but that no one understood the book. Mm -hmm. But it was available, and I had the impression in 66 that it was had been on the syllabus for a while. Interesting. Already. I'm not sure that that was the case, but but both of those books were on the syllabus in, from 66 to 7. That's very interesting. <laughs> similar, similar anecdote. I'm sorry. Uh, no, you go and then Laura. Yeah. Similar anecdote. Oh, yeah. Similar anecdote. I took historiography as a freshman studying history major from Illinois College in 1968. We read it, along with a lot of other unlikely things like Carlisle and right. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, things like that. It's it's the one certainly that stuck in my mind the most. And I was in college earlier than any of you. I was at Barnard starting in '63, and I had that very same paperback. And I think, now I would not swear to this, but if it's true, it's really interesting. I think it came from an art history class. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 We have an interesting oh, problem now. now. <laughs> it, well, was we not, it was not a medieval art history class, just yeah. there was an Netherlandish But this sort of, this sort of suggests that the seventies theory is wrong. Yeah. 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 That's what I would say. So I'm coming from the art history department it's, uh, more than anything else. And when I studied, which was of course much later than most of you here, um, <laughs> that was uh, required reading. Huh. So if you, if you think about one of the books that uh, was written by an eminent historian, turned art historian, which was um, Haskell, Francis Haskell, mm -hmm. History of Images, it's one of the examples that he's giving to actually talk about the fact that this is one of the first books that uses images as, uh, as, as sources. Right? So um, I think what, what needs to be done, I will, I will uh, probably look into that and see who has actually the history uh, reference to. Is it in some of these earlier things to reference to that? Um, I think you will find more references to this kind of cultural history uh, on the discipline of our history than in German history. I didn't know that, but it's sort of like something that I find uh, rather fascinating. The other thing is you're talking about Bokan, which is about generations earlier. I think the more interesting person to compare um, in terms of the intellectual history would be uh, Andy Warhol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. The same period. Yeah. Very, very different ideas on how to and the world, how, how to how to read that. So Warburg is essentially sort of like still into a, a mind frame of mind, but the entire thing is seen as a yeah. as a yeah. renaissance, and that's yeah. sort of like our second cultural discussion. That um, yeah. Well, so the, the idea is okay. Is that a renaissance with most mm -hmm. the imperialist? says, yes, there is, because they didn't have antiquity, therefore there were much better artists than images of nature, and blah, blah, blah. So that is a, a discourse which is, of course, uh, in 1990, very important. And uh, I think sort of like that is a question for me. You need to read this article by the Catalan art historian, which is precisely <laughs> where Pamela had it. It's on exactly this issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, I, as I said, I was just rereading parts of it in, before tonight. And, you know, his chapter on love mm. is, uh, is something. Mm. 
know, I mean, I've, it wouldn't have been in any of the books that Adam was reading when he was studying medieval history. It's really, he talks about erotic desire. He talks about the conflation of desire with the chivalric of the joust or the pandar. And, you know, I mean, it's just sort of phallic images all over the place in the chapter. And he's quite, uh, it's sort of a, a, a lyrical voice that he writes in that is not, uh, you know, doesn't even hint at any kind of pornography. But in fact, he's writing about sexual desire. Um, and so I wondered that, you know, might be right. Maybe one of the reasons we liked it was, wow, you know, this is not console. No. <laughs> no, right, no. And I think no, also, no, no, no. I mean, the, the, the working thesis that forms, behavioral forms, cultural forms, literary forms, mm. became so mechanized and brittle. I mean, he doesn't use that, but brittle and extended and you know, divorced from, con we reject that, but what we remember is all the, I mean, it's almost like mentally you file it under miscellaneous, the incredible pile of anecdotes about violence, about love that just stick one after the other, that have almost the same effect of, you know, this is a society overwhelmed by a series of formal behaviors that have kind of been cast, uh, uncast from content. But the, the, the net effect of that, we don't accept that, but we remember the examples. Hmm. <coughs> yes. Uh, I, I just want to add one, one more uh, small anecdote. <laughs> sure. This was the university in New York City. I discovered last night, I was talking with my mother, you know, and she, she, she said, oh, you were having an event on, on she called it the wedding of the middle nature, mm -hmm. and she said, Yeah, I was just going to yeah. quote from the chapter, 
so you don't have to read it. It says in the beginning, uh, and uh, I will assess the conclusion of Edward Peters and Walter Simons that, quote, given Heusinger's exp expressed interest in the visual arts, it is remarkable that his work left little or no mark in the field of art history. Art historians in the Netherlands, Belgium, and France largely ignored it, nor has it been made much of an impact on art history in the United States, which makes the anecdotal evidence that we were reading it in art history classes here uh, equally challenging. And then at the end, uh, the conclusion of the article is art historians were not swayed by Housinger's major art historical arguments, but many were stimulated by his scintillating book, which bristled with new ideas, which g goes back to my problem of what exactly is the right. influence. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, it, it's, it's intangible. Everybody recognizes this is great. How, what kind of impact is it having? In the future, we'll know that it has this impact because it challenges historians to think outside their box, for example. I mean, it's all the more interesting in, in the book, in the edited volume, you know, he was inspired by the Flemish Primitives exhibit yeah. in Bruges in 1902. Two. 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 Yeah. And also yeah. one of the um, draft titles of the book was The Age of Van Eyck. So yeah, yeah. You, it's, it's a question that puzzled us. So we did invite two art historians that contributed to volumes if we wanted that question addressed. Yeah, and we got um, from one art historian, I mean, now you should buy the book, right? <laughs> um, one art historian really tracked art historians' mm. indifference to the book, um, effectively. That's what Diane did. And then the other one that just talked about in Maximilian's court in Germany, uh, how which reproduced the performances of the Burgundian court. And so... Larry uh, Silver. Yeah, yeah Larry yeah. Silver's uh, article. So, you know, the, we have two art historians grappling with it, but we never had anybody able to fully answer one of the questions that both Adam and, and Matt uh, addressed is, why was it so hard to insert this book into professional history writing, professional study of art. And as Matt says, that tells us something about the limitations of our disciplines and the protocols of our discipline. Um, so with that note, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we should so. all put down our pencils and, I don't know, go have dinner. <laughs> so, um, I, we've run out of time, and yeah. I don't want to keep you. This has been great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. And your questions. Thank you.